Welcome to the Art and Science Method to the PM interview. First, I want to acknowledge that there are lots of interview prep resources out there. Exponent, Lewis Lynn, Product School, on and on. I know that. Which is why I first want to give you context about why I think you should care about this instead of all the other resources out there. I vividly remember the pain of preparing for my PM interviews. Like you probably, I bought multiple books, read dozens of articles, and tried out many of the services out there. I found it really overwhelming because everyone had dozens of different frameworks, were really long, and oftentimes weren't reflective of the types of questions that you typically get asked. In fact, I remember thinking I could spend five years preparing for a PM interview if I went through all of this stuff. So believe it or not, after I got a job as a PM at Facebook, I continued interview prepping. One thing about me that you don't know is that I hate complexity. So I was determined to come up with the single most fail-proof method for interviewing, and I continued to do mock interviews and help prepare friends who are interviewing for PM roles. And with every question I did, I went back and improved my approach. So now, after years of refining and hundreds of questions, I'm ready to share what I think is the most airtight method for tackling PM interview questions across product sense, execution, and behavioral. So, if you want to prepare for a PM interview in the most efficient, high-quality way, I urge you to trust me with your preparation. I believe that if you take this seriously and really digest this approach, it will end up saving you a lot of time and ultimately give you the best chance to get the PM job you're aiming for. So thank you for trusting me with your prep. All right, let's get started. Part one of the art and science PM method, the product sense interview. First, I need you in the right frame of mind. As crazy as it sounds, try to have fun with this. While it'll feel like a lot to think about at the beginning, I think you'll find that preparing for a product sense interview actually starts to feel natural with practice and even helps you during your day-to-day -day job as a PM, because it does for me. Before we jump into the structure, let's talk about the mindset. Largely, interviewers are looking for two things. One, that you're a structured thinker and two, that you can really get into the mind of users. At Facebook, they refer to this as thinking with a people-first mindset. The reason interviewers are looking for structure and empathy is that if you have these two things, you can be thrown into any team and really any company. And with structure and empathy, you should always come up with something that's reasonable to build. And it's true. So don't dread prepping for the Product Sense interview as much as possible. Think of it as training that will make you a dangerous generalist PM. Let's talk about the structure. You'll see throughout that some of this is standard and some of this is unique in different ways. While I feel strongly that this approach will cause you the least amount of headaches, feel free to take or leave any of this. Okay, grab your pen. I'm first going to list out the 12 steps of the process, then go back to each one and talk about it in detail. The first part is all about getting on the same page as the interviewer by making sure you understand the question asked and give them a preview of what you're going to talk about. This part should be fairly short, taking only a minute or so. Clarify as needed. Tell the interviewer the rough structure you're going to use. The second part is setting the stage. This part should take two to four minutes max and really grounds the interview with why are we even talking about this? Here, you mention the company mission, expound upon why the company mission may be related to the product we're talking about, then state a product mission, and state a product objective. Now we get into the core of the interview. The what to build section consists of three parts, users, pain points of those users, and solutions to the pain point. These three core steps should take up about 80% of the interview as a rule of thumb. Finally, you have the tail section. In this final considerations portion, you wanna discuss how you measure success of this product, downsides of that metric, then summarize and paint a high level vision of where this could go. Now let's revisit each of those steps one by one. In terms of question, you can be asked to be the PM of a range of different products, a real product from the company you're interviewing with, a real product from another company, a hypothetical product, or you may be asked to talk about your favorite product. Now I know what you're thinking. How can I possibly prepare for all of those products? And the answer is that you can't. 
Instead, your goal should be to understand the steps and do enough mocks that you become flexible enough to handle anything that's thrown at you. But for today, let's assume that you're asked to be the PM for a new hypothetical product called Facebook Travel, and you have to decide what to build. First, you need to ensure that you're on the same page as the interviewer. So the first step is to make sure you understand the question that was asked. But don't feel like you need to ask questions for the sake of asking questions. Ask a question or two if you are genuinely unclear. And if you even want to just simply be conservative in your assumptions, I find it's often helpful to tell the interviewer what you're assuming. So for Facebook travel, I would say, okay, if I understand right, I'm the PM for Facebook travel, which is a brand new product. I'm gonna assume that this can either be a part of Facebook or its other apps, or be a standalone app. And that I need to come up with something that could be built and tested with a handful of people in six months or less. Does that sound reasonable to you? The second step is to tell the interviewer the rough structure you're going to use to answer this question. You don't need to be super detailed, so you can describe it like this. Okay, now that I understand the question, I'm gonna think about what's important to the company, then what we should build by thinking about who uses this, what their pain points are, and then finally, we'll discuss final considerations like how you can measure success for what we build. Does that sound good to you? The second part is setting the stage, which should ground the interview by addressing why are we even talking about this? So the third step is stating the company mission. While it may seem low value, it's always good to practice to ground yourself with the company mission because everything that a company does should be in service of that larger goal. But don't waste too much time on this. Just rattle off what the company mission is in five seconds and move on to the next part. So for Facebook travel, I would say, first, I think it's important to state the Facebook mission. Facebook's mission is to build community and bring people close together. Now, keep in mind that you can reference the company or product mission throughout the interview whenever it's helpful to back up your reasoning. Doing so often has the effect of grounding the discussion when necessary and makes you appear like a principled thinker. So the fourth step is to expound upon why the company would be interested in the product we're talking about. Now, this step is really just a bridge between the company mission and the next step, which is the product mission. You don't have to be too prepared for this section, so just speak informally about some of the first ideas that come to mind that make you think of why the company may be interested in this product area more broadly. So for Facebook travel, I would say, okay, given the mission, there are a lot of reasons that I think a product area like travel could fit into Facebook's mission. Off the top of my head, there are so many parts of travel that are social and potentially bring people together. When you wanna go on a trip, you often ask people for recommendations. Then you may want to travel with people. When you're traveling, you may meet up with people. And after the trip, you may want to share your experience with other people. The fifth step is to state a product mission. Now that you've talked at a high level about why the company may be interested in this product area, now is your chance to sum it up in a high level product mission statement. Don't worry, you don't have to have the perfect mission statement like you would in, in real life if you're on a team. Just keep it high level and open-ended enough that it doesn't box you into a specific solution. So for Facebook travel, I would probably say, okay, it's clear that there are many ways in which travel can bring people together. So I'm gonna say that the mission of Facebook travel is to bring people together through travel. Does that make sense? The sixth step is to state a high-level product objective. Here, it's helpful to tell the interviewer whether you think it's more important to grow the product, make the product more engaging, or get more people to return to the product. I wanna call out that this step doesn't always feel natural to everyone, and it didn't feel natural to me when I first started. Some may even think that it's too premature to call out an objective before we even know what to build. So let's discuss the two sides of this debate first. On one side, there are people who believe that setting an objective first helps focus the team on what to build. So I'll refer to this camp as the objective first camp. On the other side, there are people who believe that an objective should be set once you know what should be built. These people would prefer to not set an objective until we've talked about the user's pain points and solutions and use the objective as a form of measurement. 
I'll refer to this camp as the objective last camp. Now, regardless of which side of the debate you fall on, let's make this simple for you. You should try to set an objective up front. And the reason is this, whether you like it or not, enough interviewers expect it. So it's in your best interest to include this additional step just so you don't possibly lose points. So what should your objective be? The PC answer is that it can be whatever objective you think makes sense for the product. But here's my advice. Engagement is the easiest option to choose in most cases. Why? Well, you can think of four high-level types of objectives. There's adoption, engagement, retention, and monetization. Of these, you can think about it in this way. You can deprioritize monetization with the assumption that the focus should first be on building a great product that people love, and monetization will follow if you do that. Of the remaining three, Engagement tells us whether we're providing value to a person. If so, this is often a leading indicator of retention for that user. Retention then tells us if that person loves the product enough to come back, and this then is a sign of product market fit. And finally, you have adoption, which if you have strong engagement and strong retention is often a matter of increasing awareness. So of these, my foremost concern is always engagement, since this tells us if and how much value we're providing to people, and that is core to the product. And my belief is that when we discuss users and their pain points, we'll be able to identify areas where we can add more value to people with our product. So as you can see there, I gave a pretty strong case for why engagement is the foundation of everything. And that logic should hold true regardless of the maturity of the product you're talking about. For both new and mature products, the most important thing at all times is to make sure you're providing value to users. And I can't think of any product where you cannot brainstorm how to provide additional value to different types of users. So there you have it. You should always set an objective and improving engagement is oftentimes the safest objective to set. So for Facebook travel, I would say, okay, in addition to this product mission, I'd like to set a high level objective for us to improve. Here, we can think of improving adoption, engagement, retention, or monetization. I'd like to cross out monetization for now, given that I think our first goal should be to ensure that we're building the most engaging experience for people. Of adoption, engagement, and retention, I'd like to focus on improving engagement, and here's why. Engagement tells me whether we're providing value to a person. This is the core of any product and ends up helping drive retention and make adoption easier as well. My belief is that when we discuss users and their pain points, we'll find areas where we can add more value for specific people and in doing so build a much stronger foundation for retention, adoption, and monetization longer term. So I'm going to set engagement as my objective. Does that sound good to you? Okay, great. Now we've set the stage for what we're talking about and why. Let's jump into the core of the interview, which is what should we build? The seventh step is the user section. At a high level, there are two things that the interviewer is looking for within the user section. First, you need to acknowledge that there are different sides to this marketplace. This shows the interviewer that you understand that this product is an ecosystem with multiple important pieces. Then you pick one of these sides to prioritize and give some reason for why you wanna prioritize that side. So for this part, I would say, first, I'd like to point out that there are a couple different sides of this marketplace. There are travelers and there are travel providers, which would include hotels, airlines, travel agents, etc. Now, it's clear that both sides are essential, but for the sake of time, let's prioritize travelers for now with the belief that if we build a product that's great for travelers, travel providers will end up benefiting as well. Now, I want to note two things in my wording there. First, the phrases for the sake of time, or if I have to prioritize, are your best friends. These two phrases are hard to argue with and are really just poking at the unrealistic expectation that you need to fully think through everything in the limited time you have. So if you're ever running short on time, just say, for the sake of time, or if I have to prioritize, and move on. Second, when picking a side, 
I find it's easiest to always prioritize the consumer side and state that my assumption is that if we build a great consumption experience, creators will end up benefiting in the future. Okay, now after prioritizing one side, the second thing they're looking for is that you show that you can really get into the mindset of all the different types of people that could use this product. Now, there are two different camps to how you can segment users. There's the Misi approach and the flexible approach. People who follow the Misi approach, which stands for mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, will try to segment users into groups that don't overlap and cover the full spectrum of users. So for travel, this could be business travelers, solo personal travelers, group personal travelers. While this approach is fine, I find it difficult because the reality is that people don't fit into MISI segmentations and there are many dimensions for how people differ. And if you take those dimensions, you can come up with an endless number of permutations of those dimensions for people. So the risk of a MISI approach is that it's either not MISI or it ends up being so high level that the segmentation isn't detailed enough to be interesting which is why I fall into the second camp of how to segment users, the flexible approach. This approach is more unique, but basically says, let's brainstorm a bunch of different dimensions for how people may differ. Then let's narrow down to a few dimensions that are interesting and ultimately select a specific type of user that we think has interesting pain points. Now, notice my wording there. Ultimately, you're trying to select a type of user that you think has interesting pain points. I say interesting because this is oftentimes not the largest user group. This is counterintuitive, and I remember when I started prepping uh, feeling this way, because in the real world, you typically gravitate towards the largest group of users. But that's not the point of this interview. No interviewer will ever say, well, they did a great job but their TAM was just too small. That will never happen. Remember, what they're looking for is for you to empathize with users in this interview. So while it may seem niche, nothing says empathy better than building a product for parents with four kids under the age of 10 who have very little time and money. Interesting users have interesting pain points, which is ultimately what your mind should be preparing for the next section. So, don't list different user types just for the sake of it, and don't worry about the largest TAM. Just worry about finding a really interesting user who will likely have some interesting pain points to talk about next. Now, one caveat, please do this within reason. Uh, so don't go after a really narrow user that seems unrealistic, like only building something for 17 year olds who want to travel with their dog. Um, so go niche but please be reasonable when doing so, um, so you can at least back up that there are enough people out there to justify doing this. Now, let's talk about dimensions you can brainstorm. First, I'll caveat this with saying that there are 100 different dimensions that you could brainstorm. So we're not gonna try to cover all of them, but one way that you can think about bucketing dimensions is into the following categories. Demographics, engagement level, and motivations. For the demographics bucket, you can come up with a bunch of different things, but some common ones you may come up with are life stage, how much money they have, how much time they have, etc. For engagement level, this is a bit more straightforward. For every product, there are people who would use this all the time and people who would almost never use this. And talking about these two different types of people is oftentimes very interesting. Finally, you have motivation. This is often my favorite one because it gets at why different people would be interested in this product area to begin with. And oftentimes, what motivates someone strikes at the very core of who they are. So for Facebook travel, I would say, 